emphasizing the not oil portion of things. Um, everybody here on this panel today is really heavily involved in the work to prevent any further expansion of the fossil fuel industry in the Bay Area, and we are really privileged to have this crew with us today. And um, I'd like to start out with introductions. First of all, I'm Shoshana Wexler. I'm a founding member of the Sunflower Alliance, which actually came together right after the 4,000 strong march on the Chevron refinery a year after the refinery exploded, sending 15,000 people to the hospital. Oh. That was a wake-up call for the greater San Francisco Bay Area. Um, it was a wake-up call for many local climate justice activists who realized that they had a serious problem in their own backyards. And Sunflower Alliance is really dedicated to fossil fuel resistance and also works in collaboration with many other environmental and environmental justice groups um, all up and down the state who are dedicated to, for example, banning fracking, uh, making sure that uh, oil drilling setbacks uh, are put in place before Brown leaves office, et cetera, et cetera. So we're really, and we work under the larger umbrella of 350 Bay Area. Um, I'd like to introduce then in the order of speaking, Greg Harris. We are very privileged to have Greg with us. He is a senior scientist of Communities for a Better Environment. He has been involved in the struggle for environmental justice and um, industrial sanity for the last few decades. A veteran who is teaching all of the rest of us newbies. <laughs> Janet Stromberg recently is an engineer who recently retired from a long uh, professional career with the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, uh, an extremely important regulatory agency, um, as you will find out. And again, we're very privileged to have her uh, here with us today. We have Margaret Rosov practicing psychotherapist and a full-time activist with Sunflower Alliance and No Coal in Oakland, who has been involved in the struggle against coal export from Oakland from the very inception. And last but not least, Zoe Sene-Sklar, <laughs> who is an organizer with Amazon Watch. And with no further ado, Greg is going to present. Hi everybody, I'm Greg Harris. Um, I'm with Communities for a Better Environment. Does, who knows CBE here? Okay. So the, the thing you need to know about CBE to understand where I'm coming from in this is that CBE is an environmental justice organization we work for and in uh, the communities that we have made mutual commitment with. Uh, those communities include uh, Richmond and Wilmington in Southern California. These are communities in the heart of the oil refining centers. Um, we're somewhat unique as an environmental justice group in that we have on staff organizers, lawyers, and scientists. We use all of those tools together. Um, I'm a scientist on staff, and I'm going I'm to be talking about the science. I'm also going to pause to allow us to welcome our... If, uh, let's see if we might need new chairs. We may not. And I'm going to reintroduce you, if you don't mind. Everybody get comfortable. Welcome. So you've just missed introductions. Um, We're very lucky to have people who are really, um, on a daily basis, engaged with crucial work uh, around fossil fuel resistance in the Bay Area. And our first speaker, and I'm going to introduce people before they present, how's that? Just do it that way, is Greg Harris, who is the senior scientist with Communities for a Better Environment, who has been on the scene, on the refinery scene, uh, and on the environmental justice scene for decades. And we're really lucky to have him here uh, this morning. And how about a round of applause? So I have a question before I get started. Um, 
Ms. Facilitator, yes. Shoshana, who's also awesome, and we'll introduce her later. <laughs> um, are you thinking we go through the presentations and then have a discussion? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I'll be pretty quick. Uh, I'm going to pause in a couple places. Uh, so get ready. Uh, there will be parts of even this part that are interactive. I'm Greg Karras. I'm a scientist with an organizing group uh, uh, that uh, our communities include communities that are really in the belly of the oil beast here. Um, so I've got a few slides to present that will help me to talk less. Um, we have a lot of experience with this. Uh, in my organization and, and right now today I think the most relevant timely thing to say is that the climate policy that, that California politicians are selling isn't working here. Okay. It won't work here for reasons they're not talking about. Yeah, thanks. Maybe you stand up your voice will um, I'll try. Better. I'll try. <laughs> Cal California is the oil refining center of Western North America. The pictures here and the numbers basically say that, that uh, this center in our state is more than three times the size of the next biggest one in Puget Sound, more than six times the size of all of Pacific Coast, Mexico and Central America combined. This is an oil refining center. This is a world oil refining center. And by this you mean the whole California. state, the whole state or just Cal Francisco? Well, the political jurisdiction is California. Oil refineries here are importing nearly two-thirds of the crude there they refine from other states and nations. They're exporting nearly a third of the polluting products to other states and nations. That fuel chain from extraction to refining to end use, wherever it may be, emits more carbon than all other activities in the state combined. And while other emissions, uh, notably the, the what was coal, there's little of that, and the gas-fired electric power emissions, um, have been on track to meet the state's climate standards. Uh, these last few years with the renewable portfolio standard, with, with other things to clean up the grid. They're on track. Oil is not. In fact, uh, it has continued under cap and trade. It has continued to emit, and the emissions have increased slightly. So this is a fuel chain, right? This interlocking fuel chain is anchored by refining here. And there's a couple points that I, I want to make about that, just as important background for what I'm going to say next. So you may know that we in this state re reduced our refined fuels demand from 12 years ago. The oil refiners didn't reduce their output. They exported more product. And as I said, the, uh, the other main emission sources have been reduced slightly. There is still more to go, but they're on track to meet the 2050 2 degrees C climate limit, while oil is not. Uh, in fact, it's slightly increased. So supply side actions, like uh, switching to electric vehicles, they're absolutely doable, absolutely necessary. They will not be enough. We must limit the refineries here. So I'm gonna walk through this, but what it's, what it's gonna say is that the, um, even if we do everything else, even if all other emissions meet the, uh, are on track and stay on track to meet the climate limit, we're going to bust through the climate limit for our state by the mid-2030s and exceed it drastically by roughly 40% by 2050. So just walking through this, the, the red line here, that's really the 2050 climate limit. And it's the cumulative emissions. It's the way the scientists do it, the way the IPCC, uh, when Paris, when they came up with what uh, is known as the two degree C international limit, that's a global limit. What that's based on is concentration in the upper atmosphere of GHGs, and most importantly, 
how much totally can we emit by 2050 as a, so California took California's portion in a particular way that we can talk about it. Equivalent emission reductions, given what everybody's emitting, our share of those emission reductions, we got it cut by 40% by 2030 and then by 80% by 2050 and make steady progress. That's this line. The reason it's all the way across is, well, to see when it gets exceeded on this path, but it's really 2050 and it's irreversible. The, uh, the dotted line is all the other emission sources if they stay on track. So that's if we do everything we can and they meet their share of the state's climate limit. The total, the black line is the total, so the distance between, of course, is the refinery fuel chain. Mm -hmm. and, this, and this is the case where we do everything else, but the refinery fuel chain uh, stays right where it's at now. Emits the same amount. Doesn't increase, doesn't decrease. The other really important, so that's what this, that's, that's what this illustrates, just to try to um, show it in the picture and use less words. The other really important thing for climate protection is what happens if we keep refining and using the same number of barrels of oil, but we do everything possible, every, use every proven technology that we have now to reduce the emissions per barrel. In other words, if we stay on oil and do everything we can all the way across the board, this line doesn't come down very much. And the reasons for this are probably obvious. We can talk about them, but briefly. Uh, you can't capture the CO2 at the tailpipe. And refining, it's a, the GHG emissions are attached to the efficiency, how much gasoline they get per amount of energy input. And since that makes them money, they've already become pretty efficient. So it's just what you hear people saying globally. We are going to need to get off of oil. And in our state, where we are an oil center, that's even more so. So that's, so what that means is that we need to be reducing the amount of oil that's being used. And here, being refined, because it's going to get used somewhere. Remember that fuel chain. It's interlocked. The oil's not going to get pumped out of the ground if it can't be refined. It's not useful for anything if it's not refined. It's going to get refined. It's going to be exported if necessary, but it's going to be burned somewhere. So we're going to have to decommission the refineries. And like we did with nuclear plants in the state. Everybody familiar with that? Mm -hmm. so, de so decommissioning nuclear plants meant retiring them and replacing their function, right? This, to decommission means transition. All right, um, I'm gonna spend a little time with this, but uh, can everyone read this chart? The question that we're gonna come back to is when. How hard this will be depends on when we start. Um, so everyone can read this? <laughs> on the uh, start now, 2020, eight plus nine equals 17. Where does the eight come from? Can anybody tell me? Existing emissions, the existing CO2? So, the polluter in this example emits 10 tons per year. And its limit over the next three years is, is 24 tons. So, and the question of how can it meet the limit, um, this just shows one way. And I, I'm wondering, does someone raise their hand? Do you know where the eight came from? I guess not. So uh, it's, it's actually super simple math. Uh, one way to meet the limit is to cut one ton each year. And if you do that, the 10 tons becomes nine tons in the first year, right? Uh, the second year, if you cut another ton, how much is emitted? Eight. Eight plus nine equals 17. Now notice that 17 is three times less cumulatively than 20, right? So. How do you get three tons less? You cut one ton first year, cut another ton from the rate next year. This is the key to why starting now allows us to move gradually. 
So what you're right. saying, the nine that was created in 2019 doesn't go away, it's still sitting there. That's right. That's it's it's cumulative emission. Right it's still, it's in the atmosphere, right? Probably hundreds of years, right? CO2. Um, and so then you get to eight, so that's 17. So that's, that's the key to it, and, and that's why you start now in this example, your pace is one ton per year. Wait a year, twice the pace. Wait two years, six times the pace. Same analysis applied to real California data. At the, uh, we start now, we'd be decommissioning only about 5% of refining capacity each year. Wait till after 2030, which is, this is the state policy track right now. Um, wait till after 2030, you could be in a position where you have to decommission more than 10 times the pace, up to 80% per year. So now you know why I showed you that boring example. You need to feel this, this is actually real, it's simple math, it's what they're not telling us. Now imagine, how hard it will be in the community it's in to replace almost a whole refinery in a single year. So you want to talk about practical feasibility. We want climate protection. This is what's feasible. I don't know anybody who knows what that is. So, so how hard this will be, it does matter when we start. And it's also, it's also absolutely true that uh, we face resistance from the oil industry, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to do things that will make it structurally easier, not harder, to fight the oil companies. And uh, I think everybody knows that the politicians that I'm actually talking about feel that pretty strongly. So, so what this shows is, is on that best case, start now pathway, how much refining capacity could be left um, by year. And this is, this is the best case. Again, if you, if you wait, if you delay, then you end up having to reduce more later to meet the limit. So this is the best case. Compare that, when it, I'm, I'm gonna compare that with what could be left in service if the refining equipment that's already built in this state is allowed to keep operating for its, it, until it wears out. And that's the orange band. This is based on California data, thousands of pieces of equipment over many years. It's pretty solid. And so the range, just to show the uncertainty of it, um, that's the range. The gap is climate-stranded refining assets. And like I said, again, this is the best case. If any of the many refining projects that are proposed now get built, that will prolong the operational duration of the refineries and this orange line moves up in the chart. So, um, delay actually makes this line go down, makes the gap greater. It's already, true that, that it's wearing out slower than we need to retire it. Uh, so the conclusion here, just mathematically, is that, that if we delay, we're going to have a greater amount of climate stranded refining assets that the industry will be motivated to protect. How will they protect those assets? By resisting climate protection, right? Mm -hmm. And it makes no sense because we're wasting so much money. Um, this is just the oil imports that we pay someone else elsewhere for, and the huge uh, waste of money and energy from using gasoline-powered drivetrains rather than electric drivetrains, which go three times as far per unit energy, about 50 billion per year, and that's at current oil prices. Economic injustice of this, it's huge. Um, these are government data for California multiple years by economic sector. Anything we put that money into to rebuild our, uh, a green economy instead of wasting it on oil, anything is going to provide more jobs. 
uh, per dollar invested. And the other thing to know about this is that, that cap and trade policies, the, the part of the state's policy that's supposed to deal with refineries but doesn't, extracts those little investments. You know, some, about 10% of the refineries' uh, emissions, they're required to buy cheap credits, maybe $14 a ton for. And that's supposed to get invested in cleaning up somewhere else. But that's outside the community. So it's inadequate, number one. And number two, it's extracted from the community. The very same communities that most need to be replacing the tax base from the refinery and the jobs in it, right? Environmental injustice. Uh, Shoshana talked about this. Um, this is a picture of the 2012 disaster. Uh, prolonged emissions are an injustice to our communities and the refineries. I, we, you guys know that. Um, it gets worsened by switching to dirtier, more hazardous oil, which was a causal factor in this incident. And it also, um, less talked about but equally felt in our communities, the economic blight, the pollution-related economic blight is severe. Uh, current state policy threatens to double down on this in a specific and irreversible way. And we need to start talking about it, so CBE is starting to talk about it. It threatens to deny refinery communities our economic and environmental rights. By blocking us from taking a path to climate and health protection that is economically feasible for us now, through policy that would delay starting down that path until it's too late. This matters to everyone's future climate for a reason that has to do with who has the power to decommission refineries. Our communities, the communities that the um, state policy has been discriminating against. We have been leading in a change that state officials don't even have the power to make. We've been stopping and slowing expansions of refining infrastructure. This is a few, these are a few examples that CBE and others here have been involved in. Using the same local permitting authorities that we could use to decommission. In fact, our communities have an essential role in this, in everyone's climate future. So you want a climate that we can live with? Fight for justice in refinery towns. And Thank you. Now, I'd, I'd like to kind of change format a little bit. Um, there might be some questions that people have uh, about what Greg has just laid out. It's pretty dense stuff. And so if anybody wants to you know, quick know, question. raise a few questions right Just now. a quick one. Um, shutting refinery capacity in California, okay. to what extent would other states or countries then increase their refining mm -hmm. to, to offset that? And what, what can we do about that? Well, um, you're, I think the premise of of your question is, is important, and I, I'm glad you asked it for that reason alone. The, um, I'm talking about what we can do here in California, what's in our control. And uh, so, for example, I'm assuming that California is not going to invade China and India, take over government there, and be able to actually stop them from importing and burning stuff that they import and burn, right? I'm assuming that some semblance to the current political legal system of the globe will remain, right? In that assumption, it's what can we do here in our state, in our community? And that's absolutely right. Um, so then the technical part of, of the answer to that question is, we're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars of built oil infrastructure. Um, and countries like China, that are trying to figure out whether they're going to leapfrog to an electric vehicle economy or try to build up their refining capacity, which is quite small and can't even refine tar sands now. Um, 
Do we have control of that? No, or just a little bit. One thing that we're doing now as a state is by allowing our government and the industry here to do this, we are making those imports to them artificially cheap, which is hurting exactly. the, their ability. So yeah, we have some influence over that, and, and that's why we have some responsibility as a state and as, as a government in this state to stop exporting pollution, right? Um, same with the imports. Uh, it, this oil, the, you know, we're, we're finding three times what we produce here, even though we're the first, fourth largest uh, oil producing state in the U.S. And of those imports, um, the largest portion of them by region is coming from the Persian Gulf. So, you know, you can talk about wars for oil uh, and all that stuff, but we are supporting that. California refineries are importing a tremendous amount of Iraqi and Saudi oil. Um, so, you know, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's like we, uh, you know, obviously we can't uh, make the whole world uh, do this without some really large changes in the politics of the globe. But what I'm saying is that we are an oil refining center and a huge one in the globe. Not the only one, but one huge one that would probably not be replaced and it would take many decades to replace this kind of refining center. Um, will that happen? I don't know. Um, but it would be species side, I guess, if it did, yeah. right? And that would be the kind of debate that one would hope would, would happen and be concluded successfully in places like India and China, Africa, right? Does that answer your question? Thank you. So actually, I think this is a good time to move on and introduce Janet Stromberg, who spent many, many years as a regulator, working as an engineer for an extremely important regulatory agency, which is our Bay Area Air Quality Management District. And Janet is going to describe the larger regulatory landscape uh, that activists, those who are crazy enough to want to set foot in this, in this maze, need to operate in, need to understand. Take it away, Janet. Okay, well, first of all, I'm going to drill down some of what Greg said very specifically to the Bay Area. So with regard to these California oil refineries, right now, Five refineries in the San Francisco Bay Area produce 40% of California's uh, refining capacity. And our population is 20% of the state. And what that means is the people that live in the corridor where those refineries are, are paying the price locally for what these refineries are doing. If you remember the jobs versus uh, whatever that graph was, tiny, tiny on the, um, it's, it's slide 13. Yeah, okay. Tiny, tiny amount of jobs in the refinery sector. I think what people don't realize is people think of the Bay Area, refiner, Bay Area economy as booming. In fact, the, the fossil fuel industry is equivalent, if not greater than, the tech industry as far as the amount of money that is made here. For a very small number of jobs, the amount of money that they are making is on par with the tech industry. And so when you see bo boosters of our, you read the business pages, which I read the business pages every day, they talk about, oh, the Bay Area economy, and they list all these things. They never, ever list fossil fuel industry. The other thing is in Sacramento, the Western States Petroleum Association, which, which represents the fossil fuel industry and the assorted lobbyists from the rest of the sector, is the largest lobbying sector in California. Could you repeat the name of that? The Western States Petroleum Association. AKA WISPA. And so what you're seeing <laughs> is a very small number of jobs for Californians with an enormous amount of profit that is not invested in our state that costs the health of the people living here. And um, I started at the Air District in, was it 1990? And um, early on, I got intrigued because there's all kinds of data that you can pull up as a staff member there. And so I wanted to know, hmm, 
I was there for health reasons back in the early 90s. I was aware of climate change, but we weren't, none of us had kind of, not very many of us had locked into it yet. And I, I, was, I was curious to know, I could see what the pollution, polluting sources are. There's about 20,000 pieces of equipment in the Bay Area that are permitted that have pollution, and the Air District tracks the pollution from each one of those sources every single year. So I did some rough looking around, and I found at that time, it seemed to me that 74% of the air pollution that people were breathing was due to fossil fuels and the whole, all of the things that we do. The other thing we don't think about is the products that we're using. Um, I would include Pittsburgh and, and that arm of things as part of the fossil fuel industry because you've got Dow and DuPont big chemical manufacturers that rely on petroleum products to make their products and that's where that we get all our plastic. That's where, you know, certain kinds of paints are made, all kinds of coatings. And so it's a, it's a, it's huge. And so because I came at a point is not only for gasoline. Yeah, it's we are consuming all this stuff. Yeah. And, and they tell us, well, we, we're consuming all this so we can't do anything about that. But our air regulations are there supposedly to make healthy air. And the Air District put out a, a, a paper in 2012 that came to the conclusion there is no identifiable safe level of PM emissions that's healthy. And so they have these numbers out there of concentration in the atmosphere and they say, well, we're satisfying the federal standard. And then they say, well, we're not satisfying the state standard. California has lower standards. But California doesn't require us to have this plan. They say we can do this little thing over here and this little thing over here. And so they don't engage themselves to say, what will it take in the Bay Area to bring PM emissions down to at least the minimum, or maybe no man-made, no human-made sources. Janet, could you explain quickly what, what PM, PM is? PM is small particulate matter that goes into our lungs that causes asthma, causes all kinds of lung um, diseases, and, and also it's associated with cancer, I believe, and heart problems and everything. So you've got an agency that's quietly giving away permits all the time, and um, the whole way that the permitting structure in the Federal Clean Air Act and the California Clean Air Act is set up assumes that if you're not violating this federal standard, you can kind of keep creeping up and it's okay. And it also assumes that where industry exists now, it's okay to have it keep existing and where it doesn't exist, you can't, you can't really do anything there. And so the places where people live where the pollution is, we've come to accept that as far as, well, that's because, you know, it's less expensive to live there, and so it's, it's like, it's treated as if it's a fact of nature. And in fact, I believe that the Air District has the authority to completely change how it does things, and it actually, with human pressure, can be made to bear. The other thing is the CEQA process, which is the land use, um, decisions that are made by cities and counties, which has been a, a large focus of the fight against the refinery um, projects that, that Greg has here. The Air District has a role in that as well. They're supposed to assess what the air impacts are and what the, what the reductions need to be of a project, and they supposedly work with the cities and counties. But in fact, they never really require very much. Their thresholds are all high and um, really what changes things is humans going to meetings and saying we're not going to put up with that. But it's very hard to get a lot of people activated because we don't really know the picture of what's going on. Um, so I'm getting lost in the weeds here. <laughs> but I, I, I wanted to point out something. Um, I worked at the Air District for 25 years. I worked in the engineering division. I was doing permitting. And they started a climate program in 2005. I was excited. Oh boy, climate program. They came out with a clean air plan in 2010 that practically every other page talked about greenhouse gases, talked about 
the threat to our la la la. And then when I read the fine print in the appendix, the actual commitments they were making to reductions was maybe less than 1%. Mm. It, was, it was a joke. And um, so I went to a conference that was, you know, I'm working there, I'm trying to find out stuff. They had a climate conference in 2010, and there was a, a, a slideshow by a consultant that makes a lot of money consulting with CE, the California Energy Commission and the California Public Utilities Commission and the California Air Resources Board. But they had a, they said the technology path to um, sustaining, or I forget what it was. Deep decarbonization. Deep decarbonization. Anyway, I went, and they had five, five, five paths. And I thought, oh my God. And they said, we have the technology to do most of this already. And I thought, well, why aren't we doing it? Because I'm an innocent, kind of wide-eyed idealist <laughs> person. So I tried to meet with our deputy air pollution control officer and discuss with her how the Air District could do this. It took me a year and a half. Mm. She kept postponing, postponing, postponing. So I was looking for uh, a venue. I knew that grassroots action is what had to happen. And I couldn't find it. I couldn't find an organization to get interested in climate at that point. So I co-founded 350 Bay Area as a last resort. I didn't regard. I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't regard 350.org as a very useful organization at that time. They, they were. People would post pictures of themselves around the world showing, showing effects of climate change, and I thought, what kind of thing is that? But I found seven people that were gathered to try to do something, and so we did form 350 Bay Area, but I came there with a campaign plan, and the campaign plan was to press the Air District to actually do a climate program. And so we got that board uh, to adopt the climate resolution to align the district's goals to the state goals which were the 80% reduction by 2050, which is, we know it's not enough, but, it, but they were nowhere near that, and to promise to implement a program to move along. So 2013, it took them four years, and they finally came out with a clean air plan, volumes one and two, a grand five or 600 pages of work, and it lays out a really beautiful vision for the Bay Area of transitioning to a clean economy. The problem is they've done nothing over on the regulatory side really to start going down that path, which is what Greg is talking about. And so the challenge there, and I retired two and a half years ago, so now instead of texting board members during meetings while I'm watching on the webcast, here's the question to ask the staff. Instead of going in the parking lot and talking with Greg for an hour, saying, what's your strategy here, maybe da, 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 da. Now I can go there openly and um, talk to them. And now, we've been there for so long, uh, the board members are starting to call Jed Holtzman and me to meet with us and ask us, what is it we're talking about? So, it's also 350. Yeah, so, so a, a, a slow sort of progress has happened, but not anything like what we need. And what we need is for people to, um, really read the business pages, <laughs> get on CBE's list, get on 350 Bay Area's list, get, I, there are many, 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 I mean, if you were at the march yesterday, there are so many organizations working on so many fronts and they're all incredibly important. That's <clears throat> yeah, so just to, just to put a point on what Jen was saying, the last, um, <laughs> the, on this list, the challenged one, Philip 66 mm -hmm. Rodeo, mm -hmm. that's a, a refinery, huge tar sands expansion. The Air District permitted a part of that expansion that will increase greenhouse gases and other emissions, uh, that does make the refinery bigger, that enables the rest of the expansion. They permitted it on uh, last month on August 16th, and on Wednesday, I got to listen to Janet uh, telling them about everything that was wrong about that. They did that without any public review or any public process. It's just a machine. It's a refinery, it's an oil industry expansion machine in that part of the agency. As I think what Janet's saying, and I totally agree. Yeah. That's a part of the problem. I'm Folks, sorry before, I'm... before we move on to introduce yet another dire topic, which <laughs> is the threat of coal, I, I would like to just gloss this just a tad, if I may, kind of 
the facilitator's prerogative, maybe. Um, this threat of increased import of tar sands into Bay Area refineries, specifically into P66, it's live, as Greg just said. Uh, the bay, the uh, back med, as we like to call it, on last Wednesday, staff said, oh, we'd really like to be able to stop it, but oh, gee. <laughs> we understand you guys. Your hearts are in the right place, but had to follow the rules. We have a problem here. We really do have to keep showing up in force at these meetings to demand that they find a way to actually regulate. Because if not, we're going to have a tar sands project permitted at P66. We're going to have almost a tripling of the number of oil tankers that are coming down with Canadian tar sands oil for refinery here in Rodeo. That's pr a pretty scary prospect. Uh, 35 it, times more. And, and, and it is stoppable. Um, many of us have been involved in some of these struggles. I want to say that I was involved up to my eyeballs in a very successful effort, hurrah, to stop a big oil terminal facility from coming into Pittsburgh. And That's that facility, Westpac. by the way, Westpac, was going to be located in a residential neighborhood, uh, primarily African-American neighborhood, right behind old folks' homes and, and churches, multiple churches and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is how the industry operates, and we, we can, uh, I think this is also a perfect segue into, we've got information back there that um, if you sign up for the Sunflower Alliance weekly announcement, we will keep you posted about all of these developments and ways that you can actually join in. Um, it's all knowable, it's all, we can find out about what's going on and, and participate. Um, and um, there is a I have, big, big, I have big, a, big, yeah, yeah. A, post, a tiny postscript. Okay. One is that I forgot the, the Air District Board has a Climate Protection Committee meeting, committee, and they're meeting on the 20th of this month, and that would be an excellent time to show up and talk about tar sands because it's on their minds. Some board members actually went to the Canadian tar sands on a field trip a few, a couple of weeks ago. And I think some of them were deeply moved by the experience. Um, some of them, they, they all went to the tar sands, they all heard the spiel from the people running it and from the government, and some of them also went to a follow-up meeting with Idle No More to hear about the indigenous fight against it. So they, there is a ripeness over there to hammer on this point to them, and this Phillips project is all about bringing tar sands to the Bay Area. The other thing is I think the next board meeting is the 17th, mm -hmm. and they're actually going to talk about that tar sands trip there, and they're going to talk about Phillips 66. So um, keep your eyes and ears open there because we need bodies. And every time new people show up, it's, it's even greater because they've seen a lot of us for five years. <laughs> Can you give the address of the Air District? It's at 398 Beale Street. It's called the Metro... 375. 375. Oops. 375 Beale, B-E-A-L-E -E Street. And it's walkable from, from public transit, so it's... It's no about problem. four blocks from the uh, Market Era Bart Station. And, so and at Trans Bay. We need we need to move yeah. on. Okay. Uh, again, people can sign up for Sunflower Alliance weekly announcements, and we will absolutely let you know what that address is. <laughs> Another very pertinent information. I'd like to introduce Margaret Rosoff, who has been a warrior with no coal in Oakland ever since that whole uh, nasty coal proposal raised its head. Take it away. So we're going to transition from soil, not oil, to soul, not coal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, how many people here are from outside the Bay Area? Uh, San Francisco. Mostly, mostly local. Right. So have people been hearing about the Oakland coal struggle? Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay. So I'm just not clear how much background to give. Um, so one thing I'll say is no coal in Oakland, which is a grassroots organization, has developed an incredible website with all kinds of information on it. So a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about, if I'm speaking too quickly or you've heard too much or you want to know more, you can find on the website. You can find the judge's decision. You can find the letter to the Bank of Montreal. You can find an analysis of the organizing campaign that led to the ban. Lots and lots of really good stuff is, is there. 
Um, and another thing I'll just say to get it out of the way is that we're going to have another, for people who didn't do enough demonstrating tomorrow, we're going to be demonstrating on Wednesday. In fact, if I could figure out how to get it on the computer. There are some yellow, orange and yellow um, things there. If you just go to the, back to the desktop. Well, I just want to get back to the desktop so I can put my, my one my one my one up there. Anyway, there's, there's copies here um, in yellow um, about our demonstration, and I will contextualize it here. So a lot of, in terms of the coal campaign, a lot of people have been saying, well, didn't you win the ban from the city? And then other people are saying, well, didn't the judge overthrow the ban? And other people are saying, what does the Bank of Montreal have to do with any of that? So I'll try to uh, cover that trajectory. So how many people here were stuck on that the city did ban coal? How many people know that and don't know anything further? Um, yeah. Okay, so people know that the city banned coal and then the developer sued in federal court and the judge overthrew the ban. How many people knew that? Okay. So, <laughs> so there goes my talk. <laughs> lucky, lucky you. <laughs> I mean, I guess what I, I want to start by saying, um, because Greg was talking about decommissioning, this story actually begins with decommissioning too in another way, which was that the federal government decommissioned the Oakland Army base and gave some of that land to the port, to the port of Oakland and other land to the city of Oakland, and that's being beating the swords into plowshares that's being used for a recycling station and a trucker's truck stop kind of thing, and for this marine terminal. So our, um, the city specified, the city signed the 66 year lease agreement for the terminal to be done by this developer, Phil Tagami, who was our big focus um, of the campaign for a long time. Um, he had promised that they weren't going to ship coal and then they did, et cetera. But after, as the court case proceeded, our focus shifted from Phil Tagami being our target because we discovered that really who was behind it was the Bowery Coal Company. Yeah. And we've been saying, why doesn't he look at other products? You know, why is he only looking at coal? Well, guess what? Because he's being funded by the Bowery Coal Company, so why would he bother looking for any other products? They're the people who are paying for the court case, millions of dollars. The, their attorneys are the second highest paid firm, I think, in the world. Their partners made like $5 million each in 2016. So he's got a lot of backing. So we're more concerned these days by Bowie than we are by Phil Tagami, right? So it turns out that in order to build this coal terminal, they were saying that they needed $250 million. That was an old figure, so I'm guessing they probably need closer to $300 million by now. The first $50 million of that, um, they got a commitment from the state of Utah. How many people know about this Utah coal thing? So they got a commitment from the state of Utah to spend um, $53 million um, or lend $53 million toward the construction of this. And that would be like seed money, so other investors would say, oh, we've already gotten 20% of what we need, give us some more money. Um, that money is kind of greenwashed by the um, legislature in the state of Utah because it was originally going to come from the four counties that produce oil, one of which is conveniently named Carbon, um, and they get, what, they get lease money from the federal government because in places where a lot of land is federally owned and used for extraction, the local areas are not collecting tax money from businesses or houses that are there, so the, the federal government gives them this money to help finance them. And the idea is that money is supposed to make life better for the people who live there. It's not supposed to go to pay for a coal terminal in Oakland, right? But um, that was the plan, and then it got kind of greenwashed through the state legislature. But that still leaves $200 million that they needed. The guy who was behind all this is a man named Jeff Holt. He used to work for Goldman Sachs, one of our favorite companies, and he now works uh, for the Bank of Montreal. Who had ever heard of the Bank of Montreal a couple years ago? Not me. Uh, the Bank of Montreal subscribes to all these um, sustainable objectives. They are signed on to something called the Equator Principles, which are principles of responsible investing. The Equator <laughs> Principles include consultation with stakeholders and include um, figuring in the social and environmental costs of a project. The Bank of Montreal, in attempting to finance the coal terminal in Oakland, has done neither of those things. 
the stakeholders are primarily, everybody along the rail lines, but it's primarily the people who live in West Oakland, which is, makes it a huge environmental justice issue because that's a community that's already extremely overburdened by pollution. Between the freeways, the port, the diesel trucks, and industry, you know, it's like the people there have asthma at rates something like five times the rates of people in the hills. I mean, it's you know the, all the effects of the particulate matters that were referred to earlier in terms of respiratory and cardiac and cancer kinds of consequences. They're already significantly higher in West Oakland. And although it's now getting gentrified, it has been a community of color and a low-income community. So no one in the Bank of Montreal went and talked to people there and said, do you like the idea of our financing the culture here? No, that did not happen. They belong to a number of other organizations that are all about responsible investing. One of them is called Principles for Responsible Investment. And very conveniently, the Principles for Responsible Investment is going to be meeting on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. They timed it to coincide with the Global Climate Action Summit. So we are going to be there. Uh, we're going to be there for one, call, one purpose is to basically make public what the bank is doing and kind of shame them around the other sustainable folks. And the second thing is to alert the people there to not ex um, invest in something that the Bank of Montreal is promoting. We have um, a document called the term sheet that was like a sort of an advertisement for the investment that was done by this guy, Jeff Holt. And it doesn't mention coal at all. It's all about an infrastructure investment on the, on the Oakland waterfront. You know? So um, we were first trying to figure out, he said he was going to try to raise the money from pension funds. So we we're trying to figure out how do we get to every pension fund and tell them, don't buy it. But this is a good way to get to a bunch of them. And some really major pension funds are going to be there. Fortunately, also, a number of our allies in the environmental movement are also going to be there. And several of them have committed to talking to the bank representative there and um, to um, talking to investors there. So this is a very exciting moment for us. And I'm going to pull this up in a second, maybe. <laughs> Come on. Well, maybe I won't bother because I'm going to the wrong thing. I'm not. Uh -huh. Oh, here we go. Calendar PDF. That's it. Well, double click it. What? Double click. I'm used to using the mouse, which I didn't. You see? That's there the click. <laughs> Yay! Thank you. <laughs> anyway. So you can see the, the address and stuff is there. So if, if you think of the dog, um, come there, come there and do that. Um, oh, let's see. <laughs> anyway, you guys can be my, my tech backups. Um, so the, the st status right now for the, for the coal thing is that the um, judge's decision has been appealed, both the city of Oakland and the intervener Sierra Club and San Francisco Bay Keepers have filed appeals in the case. There are some good bases for appeal because um, he laid out a bunch of his reasons for uh, saying that the ban was not justified. Um, for one thing, he said that the study didn't look at the mitigation of covered coal cars. And there are no covered coal cars anywhere in the world because they're kind of dangerous um, risk of spontaneous combustion. Another thing he said was that the air study that was relied on involved um, the Northwest involved coal from the Wyoming Powder River Basin, which is a different chemical composition than coal, excuse me, than coal from the um, Utah area. Um, so we're going to come up with some studies of Utah coal um, and other ways, um, other legal channels around that. That's going to take a number of years. Another possibility is to just redo the scientific testimony that led to the ban and come up with better testimony that the judge would feel upheld the ban. He actually said in his order there was nothing to stop the city from doing that. But the third wing of um, approach is what we're talking about here. If they don't have the money to build it, it doesn't matter what happens in court. Maybe they'll even drop out of the lawsuit. I should say one more thing about the lawsuit, and then I'm going to move on geographically. The, the um, suit was filed in federal court, and one basis was that the um, contractual rights of the, um, well, I'd say the coal company, but the contractual rights of Tagami who signed the contract were being violated, that he had a vested right to ship coal, and that um, 
is a kind of limited state of California issue. But it was filed in federal court because they also said he had a constitutional right to ship coal, and this is related to something called the Dormant Commerce Clause, which has to do with things that weren't actually written in the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, but have been imported into it as a result of subsequent court decisions and legislation. And that's an iffy subject. It's not like the lawyers could say, oh yeah, we'll prevail on the Dormant Clause or we won't. There recently was a good decision on the Dormant Clause in Portland, Oregon, which is, okay, in Portland, Oregon, which set up um, a couple of regulations, local regulations, one saying that there could be no new fossil fuel infrastructure and the other saying something else, which I'm now forgetting because of time pressure. And that was just upheld at the, at the appellate level. We don't know whether that will go further, but the, you know, the issue is that the rights of local jurisdictions to set limits on pollution, whether it's coal or oil or something else, you know, is under threat legally by, by these lawsuits. So um, that's the coal in Oakland story. I want to quickly talk for a minute about coal in Richmond. Coal has been shipped from Richmond, California for a long time. Coal and pet coke, which is a byproduct of oil refining, which also is a mass of particulate matter <laughs> to simplify it scientifically. And, um, a couple of years ago, the amount of coal and pet coke being shipped went up dramatically. You can see the, the blue is pet coke that went up a lot, and the yellow is coal, which has recently gone up. This is because domestic markets for coal have dried up, you know, thanks to our successes and um, with, um, ending the reliance on coal, refined, coal the, um, generation of power. But um, the stranded assets of coal in the ground is now being shipped to um, other countries, so this, these West Coast ports are particularly important to them. So the, the coal in Richmond comes from Stockton on ships, but the ships can't be fully loaded because the Carquinez Straits are too shallow. Watch for the danger of wanting people, people wanting to dredge the Carquinez Straits down the road. But what they do to top the ships off is bring it in by, coal, by train. And you can actually, if you're at the port tracks in uh, Richmond at the right moment, you can actually see these open coal cars coming through, and then they go down and get loaded on the ships. So because of this recent increase, and because of sort of where things are at with the Oakland coal struggle, people are starting to meet week monthly in Richmond to talk about what they can do about it, um, trying to uh, activate the city council and see if um, we can get some, at least cutbacks, and hopefully maybe an end to the shipment of coal through Oakland, through, through Richmond. So that's a campaign to watch out for. Um, you know, Richmond already has this, this Chevron economy, so, and also their own share of industry. So there's massive pollution from multiple sources here that has to be kind of teased out. And I'll just say one last sentence, which is Vallejo. Vallejo is facing um, the prospect of a um, cement factory called Orkem or Orsum, and um, hard sea or soft sea? Um, soft sea. So, or, Orsum. Um, which, again, it's very similar to the Pittsburgh story or the Oakland story. It will be built very close to where people live. And they did a study saying it was not an environmental justice issue because that neighborhood is no poorer than the rest of Vallejo because all of Vallejo is so poor. <laughs> Hello. Um, it's a neighborhood of color, by the way. What? It's a neighborhood of color. Well, surprise. surprise yes. Um, so, here. The, uh, um, so there's a fight against the Orson, um, I want to say refinery, but the Orson plant um, being led by a group called Fresh Air Vallejo, so check them out. And they're actually a little bit concerned about coal as well. And one of the reasons is that a lot of the property that's close to where this, they want to build the, chemi the chemical cement plant, a lot of that property is owned by Kiewit, K-I-E-W-I-T. Kiewit is a construction firm. They're the ones who are supposedly fixing the Oroville Dam, which was just going millions of dollars over a cost, and um, they kind of have a bad record for the things that they can construct. <laughs> Turns out they own some coal mines, who knew? So oh. the fact that this property right here is owned by people who own coal mines is a little worrisome as well. So um, we're cutting back on the use of coal in California, but we haven't really cut back on using California as a shipment route for coal to go to other places that aren't doing so well. It's also interconnected, as Greg's answer earlier was. So I'll take questions when we get to questions. Thank you so much, Margaret.
And finally, uh, I'm sorry we're rushing through all of this, but you can see how really detailed and prolonged all of these uh, struggles are because these issues are so dense. Mm -hmm. And resistance to them is, is slow and, and enduring, okay? Um, Zoe is here from Amazon Watch to talk about yet another serious issue, and that is really the destruction of the Amazon uh, so that it can be plundered for palm oil, for crude oil, which is coming also to Bay Area refineries, or refineries to be processed. Well, thank you. Um, so yeah, as Shoshana said, the local is connected to the global. A lot of oil from the Amazon is being imported here to California, which is in turn hurting communities here. So seeing that chain of destruction throughout the world, really. Um, but taking a step back, I want to kind of give you a brief reminder of what, like, what the Amazon is as a place, right? So um, as an organization, we work to protect the rainforest and advance indigenous rights. We've been doing this work for over two decades and really have seen that indigenous peoples are the best stewards of their lands as they have been for millennia. So we work with communities that are opposing industrial development projects on their land and find ways as a US-based group to support that work. Um, next slide. Um, so yeah, stopping Amazon destruction, advancing indigenous solutions, and supporting climate justice. Um, go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, but the Amazon, it's the world's most biodiverse rainforest. It's so huge, and the formatting has gotten strange here. But yeah, so it's one-tenth of all the plant and animal species are in this rainforest, which is just incomprehensible. Um, one of the places where oil drilling is happening in the Ecuadorian Amazon has more tree species in one hectare than all of North America. So just oh, wow. huge, yeah, just <laughs> remarkably, a remarkably special place, and also home to about 400 indigenous nationalities who have lived there and depend on the land for their survival. Um, next slide. Um, so yeah, there are these threats that Shoshana outlined. There's dams, there's agribusiness, there's mining, and the, one of the big drivers, which is really underlooked in the Western Amazon, is oil drilling. Um, next slide. So, yeah. These oil blocks are covering a side area larger than Texas. This is Ecuador, and so the Ecuadorian Amazon is basically from here over, and it's almost all zoned for oil and gas drilling. And all of it? Yeah, so all, all of these areas in color here, these are all areas that are, have been blocked out for drilling. And there's mostly right now drilling happening in the north. Um, if any of you are familiar with the Chevron case, where there was purposeful mm -hmm. dumping, and still communities fighting for justice for cancer and for like ongoing destruction 20 years later, that was in this region, but they're actually planning a new oil round. They're tendering the land in this area, which is roadless rainforests. You can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so this is sort of a picture of what oil drilling can look like in the Amazon. So this is in Yasuni National Park, this place which is the most biodiverse place in the world, and the government and the state-run oil company said, don't worry, we're going to build an ecological pathway. It's going to be fine. And so then people went in, and lo and behold, the ecological pathway is about 30 meters wide. So that's the sort of destruction, the sort of deforestation that's happening, along with all the impacts you are familiar with on water and on community and on health that go along with oil. Um, so I'm talking about all of this because there's this really real California connection. Half of the oil that's exported from the Western Amazon is coming to California refineries. And that's like over almost 200,000 barrels of oil from the Amazon coming in um, every day. So it's, it's something we're not thinking about and it's part of this bigger picture. It's part of why when you talk about Greg, what Greg was talking about, about how communities are impacted by refineries, it's part of how communities here in California are impacted. It's all part of this fossil fuel powered economy that doesn't serve us. Can go to the next slide. Um, then you can click twice. Uh, so this is just to like, people are often like, oh, like where, where is it coming? What refineries? And so you can see that some of it is coming into the bay. Um, this Tesoro refinery, which is now Marathon, um, is receiving a lot of oil from the Amazon, as is Shell, and all of them are receiving oil 
that's coming from there. The El Segundo refinery is getting almost a third of the oil that it processes. This is the biggest refinery in the state. It's coming from the Amazon. And in total, if you want to click one more time, this is 11% of the oil that's processed in California. It's coming from the rainforest. Um, so, next slide. Um, yeah, so you can just get the sense. So it's, the second largest source is, is Ecuador, and then Colombia is coming in third. So we're getting our oil from Saudi Arabia, and then we're getting our oil from the rainforest. Um, next slide. But, yeah, so you can yeah, skip past that, it's fine. Um, mm -hmm, yeah, but I think that the reality is that it's like all of this can seem really heavy and bad, but because it's all so bad, it's all pretty interconnected. We'll click through a few more times. Um, so California is a big oil processing state. It's also a big oil drilling state. Um, so it's the sixth largest oil producing state in the country. So we're continuing to drill since Governor Jerry Brown has come into office. There have been over 20,000 new permits for oil and gas. Um, and we're standing here as part of the fifth largest economy in the world. So to the question from this gentleman of what we can do, we're in a position of a lot of power. What California does can lead the world and can actually set an example if it's not doing right now. Um, so in that, there's this campaign that's ongoing that's called the Brown's Last Chance Campaign. So our governor is about to leave office. He's hosting this big climate summit. Are you all following the climate summit that's happening? Yeah. Oh, tell us about yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, he's coming together to talk about how great we're doing on climate change and how great California is and how we should all celebrate what's happening and not worry too much about this crisis that's so huge and existential. So this, is, this coalition of over 800 organizations has been putting a huge amount of pressure on Jerry Brown to do the right thing and say no to new oil and gas permits. So saying, okay, we're in a hole, we can't keep digging, we can't keep expanding fossil fuel infrastructure to create setbacks. Um, right now there are oil wells literally in people's backyards. Um, which in the United States is pretty uncommon, there's usually setbacks. So creating a, creating a health and safety buffer and then creating this plan that Greg was beginning to touch on of having a phase out, having a managed decline of production that moves us onto clean energy. And it's like if anywhere can do it, California can. Um, so I think that that to me is, like, is a hopeful note because there is this movement and it's global and we're out on the streets and we're pushing to create this movement, create this energy to keep fossil fuels in the ground, and people are hearing it. It used to be that our partners in the Amazon who've been saying keep fossil fuels in the ground for over 20 years, that they were like the crazy ones. Everyone was like, yeah, how are we gonna do that? But now science is telling us, if you wanna go to the next slide, that that's like really, that's what we need. We need to keep two thirds of fossil fuels in the ground. We have to eventually phase out, shut down existing production sites. and. In California, we can do that. Like it's, it's more challenging in certain places. And looking at the webs of connection and looking at oil coming from where it's coming from and how to phase out each piece, it's harder. But California can say, okay, we're at this point of crisis, we're going to take action. And a lot of that oil won't actually get extracted. So if you keep fossil fuels in the ground, people are always like, oh, but like, won't, it, won't there be leakage? Won't people just build it out like somewhere else? But they've actually like looked into that and studied and it's like, at least half a barrel of, will not be extracted. So really, cage isn't going to undermine all the work there. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide. Like, I know you're all here at this conference, but there's like so much that's happening in the next week if you're still in the Bay and like so many ways to plug in. Like this climate summit can either be a moment when everyone talks about how great we're doing on climate change and the media comes in and says, like, oh, climate change, like maybe, like, maybe we have it under control. Look how great Governor Brown is. Or there can be the message that we need bolder action and that we can take that action. Um, so there's a lot of ways to get plugged in. Um, tomorrow, bright and early, there's going to be a rally against climate capitalism, against using, saying, like, we're going to protect forests so refineries can continue to pollute, and then protecting forests doesn't actually mean anything because the communities are already protecting their forests. So that's opposing these offset programs tomorrow morning. Um, the Wednesday and Friday events are events that Amazon Watch is putting together. We have indigenous leaders from the Quechua community of Sadayaku and the Ecuadorian Amazon who have been fighting to keep fossil fuels in the ground for 
for many years and winning. Um, who are going to be here along with other leaders from across the world talking about their work. So that's Wednesday and Friday events. And then on Thursday, there's going to be a massive direct action, which is part of this Brown's Last Chance campaign push and part of the Solutions to Solidarity Summit that's being put together by It Takes Roots. And it's a moment as world leaders, as business people are going into the summit to say, hey, stand with communities, not corporations. Do what's actually necessary on climate. Don't just pat yourself on the back for doing nothing. So it's going to be really big and powerful, and it's going to be more big and more powerful the more people are there. So if like, you can, I want you all to go to our panels, but if you can make it to one thing, the 7 a.m. event is really a key one. So yeah, thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> You know, I'm sorry we got off to such a late start because unfortunately I am told we have to be out of here in 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> but since we started so late, maybe the next folks will be running late too. So I think we have some time for questions. I did pass out cards, but that it may not be necessary to write them out. Why don't we just Talk. speak out if you, yeah, if you, you have a question you'd like to raise. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, uh, about six or seven years ago, I was working on human right to water work down in the Central Valley in California. And one of the things that I found out was that 40% uh, of the income for um, the county, the current county down there, was coming from oil and gas. Mm -hmm. And thinking about how low income the community is and what kinds of things the county funds, and just thinking about exit strategies uh, for impacted communities where people are making their living in the oil industry. Mm -hmm. And just wondering you know, how many thoughts you have yeah. We all have that. <laughs> yeah, so CBE and, um, and close allies, in particular Asian Pacific Envi Environmental Network and, and Urban Tilth in Richmond, had, uh, a couple years ago we launched a, an intentional multi-year just transition project to address that issue in real specific uh, community terms. And uh, that's actually where the presentation that I gave grew out of. The first question that we needed, practical question that you come up with was, well, how much, how fast? You know, we have, as Janet said, we have all the technology we need. There's a whole array of alternatives um, that are economical. Some might be a little cheaper, might be a little more expensive, but compared to societal survival, we can do it. Um, the thing is, they need to be fit into each specific community, and, and how do you fit them in? Well, you need to know how much, how fast to, to actually do that. And as you all know, but we keep reminding ourselves through this struggle every day, it's really not about the science. We, we know we have to do this for our societal survival. We know that we have the technology. Um, politics can change the law. This is about social capacity. So. What, what we're starting with is building the capacity. And, and those are things like, in, you know, the kinds of communities you're talking about, a lot of our youth are in jail. So this extends to uh, close allies who are working on uh, a safe return and just returns from prison into the economy and into society. Uh, you can imagine how broad it has to be to be real. That is what we are doing. Um, what I showed you was the underpinnings of how far, how fast, and how state policy is actually hurting that uh, by promoting delays in, in starting and by extracting wealth and attention from the community and, and trying to frame it as not be, as being about anything else besides us as people and what we all need, right? So that's one part of the answer. And then in terms of the direct jobs, a point I forgot to mention is Another part about doing this gradually so that it's economically feasible to decommission refineries, it's a small technical point, but it answers your question. Um, refineries run like any machine. They run efficiently within a certain design band. When they're, when they're running at much lower feed rates, they need to be resized so that they can run efficiently and economically and safely. So gradually decommissioning them actually means more jobs in resizing that equipment over and over again, the things they call turnarounds, which are planned years in advance, implemented by thousands of workers 
each time. So we get the building trades on our side for a change. <laughs> well, there's politics to it, but, but I'm talking a little bit more broadly. I'm talking about societal capacity. This is an existential societal issue, and it's on us to come together. That's what solutions to sol solidarity to solutions means. We, we're going to have justice and a climate we can live with, or neither one. You can't pick and choose between those. So I would like to also take a crack. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's a super, super important question. I guess to give you like maybe a this broad picture answer, Greg has it covered. I think specifically, like there are plans in place. One of the things I love about this coalition, the Brown South Trans Coalition, is that there, we actually have put together analysis on what a plan could look like and what compensation for workers in the oil industry could look like. If you want a specific resource, there's a report called The Sky's the Limit in California. Um, the Sky's the Limit, California, by an organization called Oil Change International that outlines what a plan could look like. And again, the reality is that there are certainly workers who would be impacted, certainly communities that would be impacted, and that is not like the big driver of jobs across the state. And like even in Kern County, it's like it's an agricultural hub too, right? So it's like there's a push and pull, and the jobs argument is important. And I think that can be sometimes like oversold in the big picture. So in in Richmond and Benicia, we're talking about several hundred jobs in the refinery, mm -hmm. but we're talking about 25 to 33 percent of the tax base that mm -hmm. supports sure. all, a, huge, a much bigger number of jobs. So again, um, this is the danger and the threat of a state climate policy that's industry or corporation driven that talks about anything other than people. When you start asking the questions you're asking, then you start to get to real answers. I guess I have a thought on that, a little bit un, undefined, but I always go back to really how wealthy this state is, how wealthy this region is, and what are we doing with that wealth and what are our priorities? And so as a state, we have to demand that human beings come before profits. We don't, and, and that money be moved to where the need is, and that the types of jobs that are going undone because nobody wants to pay for them are things that care for humans and things that care for the environment that actually make, that the word sustainable is thrown around all the time, but nobody's thinking about that in terms of people. And so it's really a massive change in taxation and a lot of assumptions in our whole ec economy that assume we have to preserve the wealth that a few have and that we can keep siphoning more and more to those people and that's not that is not sustainable and so we have to talk about human communities as sustainable and that has to get more into our brains um, I look at it also as that gentrification is a driver of climate change because if you look at, um, you can look at greenhouse gas emissions from the sources. You can also look at it from our consumption. And if you see a map that the Air District did, they, they do some good work if you use it the way it needs to be used, not the way they're using it. You'll see that it's the wealthy areas that are responsible for the consumption that, ha that are driving the emissions for all the products that people are buying because they have a lot of extra money that they don't need and they're buying a lot of things they don't need and our whole society is predicated on this idea of growth. So there's my socialist speech. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, but and it's mild way. compared to what the firefighters union was saying on the march. <laughs> <by the way. laughs> but, but I think that that needs to be ingrained in our thinking about this. Um, that when you think about money and and oh my God, the tax base is going to be lost. Well, the state has the ability to take that money and put it where it needs to be. So, mm -hmm. It's a very wealthy, wealthy state. What is it? The third largest, fourth largest economy, whatever. In the fourth or fifth. They like to brag about that, but they don't talk about what that should mean. Right. If it was a country, it'd be part of the G5. Yeah. If the, if the Bay Area was a country, it's the size of Denmark. It's a country here. We and the state has the capacity to create incentives for green jobs. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. They can create trainings around solar panel construction. 
But also, also more medical people, more people that are caring for the land, more people that are doing all kinds of things that we're not doing. The state legislature killed a bill this year that would have required, um, basically said, well, you, we're not going to register a bunch more gasoline cars. You're going to have to start buying electric ones. <laughs> Beijing did that a couple years back, and they put a million electric cars on the road in a year. So, you know, we could, there's, there's obvious things we can do. I have a question about that, though. Uh, it, how is the electricity, isn't the electricity being produced to oil? I love that you asked that question. So, um, the short answer is that it's cheaper, better, because of the basic natural laws of how energy works. Mm -hmm. um, the longer answer is that, you know, starts with, you go three times as far in an equally sized electric vehicle than in a gasoline car, and then gets into how and, and this, there's been studies done on this. Already, the lifetime cost of owning a vehicle uh, is cheaper if it's, if it's all electric in California, Texas, in Japan, in the UK, where the studies have been done. Um, and that's with the subsidies that we've got now, uh, but it's getting cheaper all the time. So then, the, you know, and the electricity, well, sun, wind, there's plenty of them. And when you can put that together with electric cars with batteries, then you solve the battery problem, because the sun doesn't shine at night, right? Mm -hmm. So it fits as a system. And uh, the state has known that. That's been actually peer-reviewed science for seven years now, for California specifically. The, the, like I said before, there's, there's um, but I, I have a question for you guys, if I could step in with a question. Um, so we are at Soil Not Oil and CBE's partners in this coalition know a lot more about uh, what we need to do with, with transforming sustainable agriculture than I do. Uh, I do know that a big, a big part of what supports large-scale corporate monoculture is not just pesticides but fertilizers. And, you know, that sulfur and especially that nitrogen, that's coming from refineries. So, do y'all know, is anybody thinking about the connection between the, the change we need in how we grow our food mm -hmm. and oh, the definitely. change we need in oil? Does anyone want to talk about, to educate me about that? <laughs> so how we grow our food? So the food system, I mean, the food system is like, it's, the food system we have, the monocrop culture that we've developed in this country, um, creates a ton of pollution by destroying the soil. So when we till the soil in a massive capacity, like some folks were talking earlier today, I'm not sure if one of our presenters mentioned that, but, oh yeah, when um, Singing Frog Farms presented. So when we have extreme tillage of the soil, we release all the carbon into the air that increases um, CO2, that increases the temperature of the earth, that creates more extremities, and the pesticides we use are polluting the water, creating birth defects, which is something we've been talking about for years. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, to resolve that and to grow with agroecological principles, we're putting soil, we're putting carbon back into the soil, mm -hmm. and we're fighting climate change, basically. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're here to do. That's what I'm here to do. Mm -hmm. I'm here to find a space to do that so that we can grow grow food in a way that heals the earth and heals us. Yeah. So one of the polluter arguments Great. we hear from the oil industry is that it's all these products. It's your plastic. That's a different subject, but actually the superior plastics are not made with petroleum. So there's a solution there. But one of the things they say is that, you know, this is how we grow your food. And so I wonder how much having this giant byproduct of sulfur and nitrogen coming out of the oil sector into the uh, monoculture systems. I wonder how much that subsidizes them and how much, um, uh, is it, are they actually half right when they make this argument that, that we could not have the kind of giant monoculture system that we have without also having the oil system that we have? Are they, are they mutually interdependent? I, I just they go hand in hand. Yeah. In one of the talks given this morning, we saw that 75% of the food that's eaten on the planet is grown by small farms. This whole idea that we're relying on this monoculture system is a myth. The monoculture system produces 25% and uses 80% of the resources. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Told you I didn't know. 
<laughs> we don't need monocrop farming to feed the world. Yes. Yeah. It, isn't it also true that you're getting a very narrow band of what the plants need and you're actually starving the soil because the plants pull all the nutrients out of the soil and when you're not replenishing them, you're putting nitrogen in there but you're not putting anything else in and so the quality of our food is actually going down um, because the micronutrients are there. And the other thing is that the exhaust from all our cars is depositing extra nitrogen on the soil which is actually harming a lot of a lot of plants. It's right, and that's why we see a lot of people hungry. Even though we have so much food, we have so much available, and there's tons of food waste, which is one problem. There's already the lack of nutrients that are actually yeah. reaching your body yeah. because we're not growing it on soil that has no life in the soil. Right. Mm -hmm. And soil is an organism. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just want to say the other people on this panel, I think, are have worked full-time in the past or are working full-time now um, on these issues. It's possible to do it part-time if you're working or going to school or raising a family, maybe fewer hours, but I really encourage people to be grassroots activists and figure out how you can put a little bit of your time into it because you'll feel much better when you go to bed at night. Yeah. <laughs> and you probably, I think all of you know this. Uh, these types of events, and there's more of them over the next week, those have been planned um, by large numbers and very diverse uh, uh, groups of, of people for a year or more, well, almost a year now. And, and they're, they're great opportunities. Uh, we do need everybody. Uh, please jump into these. And I do actually think that Zoe is correct that, that the uh, Thursday event is really important. But don't forget my Wednesday event. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's a great opportunity the next week, and you have lots of choices. Something will fit your schedule. Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing, and that is that Sunflower Alliance has a fabulous calendar on their website. You can, you can, we have a sign-up sheet there. Uh, you'll get a weekly announcement on Monday morning. That's uh, it, once a week. Once a week, that's it. We don't send out anything else. And that will tell you what's going on, primarily in the Bay Area. Uh, and we also have a deep set of resources on all the things that have been presented here today and more. Plus, there is a great pamphlet that will explain. Thank you, Jean Tepperman. Will it wasn't just me. It was a group effort. It was a group effort, but Jean was the driving force on uh, refineries and what what, how to begin to understand about the refining of oil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.